I was um, 16 or 17 years old, driving my father's 1984 Volkswagen Rabbit on an errand to get parts at the auto parts store in the next town over. I'm not a guy who keeps my wallet in my pocket at all times, and so I forgot to grab it before I jumped in the car and took off. From the factory, that car didn't have a radio, and so I'm not sure what I was doing as I crossed the yellow line on the corner, going at least 15 miles per hour over the speed limit. But the cop coming towards me didn't care. He turned on his blue lights, and before he even turned them on, I knew I was in trouble. I had no ID. I was speeding. I had crossed over the yellow line, but I had two advantages. My shirt said Kidder's Repair Service on it, which is the name of my dad and grandfather's business, and the car was registered in my dad's name. See, not only did my, my dad and my grandfather own a car repair shop in town that that frequently serviced the municipal vehicles, the fire trucks and police cars. They also owned a towing company, and my dad was the only tow truck operator around who would come out in the rain or snow or at night. Pretty much every time dispatch called, he would get up and go. So the police were grateful to him, and as a result, I did not get a ticket that day. Fast forward a few years. Chris and I and the boys had moved to Ohio. And one summer, around maybe 2003 or 2004, something like that, we were back in New Hampshire visiting. We took a drive past our old house, and the main road there, Portsmouth Street, is wide, flat, and straight. I was cruising along it maybe 50 tops, and soon I saw those blue lights again. This time my car was registered in my name in the state of Ohio, which is 830 miles from New Hampshire. This policeman did not know my father, and I didn't ask if he knew who I was. I was clearly a foreigner in his eyes, even though the first house I ever bought was less than a mile from there. I found out when I got that ticket that the speed limit on that stretch is actually 35 miles per hour. But here's the thing. In one case, I wasn't paying attention. And even though I didn't get a ticket, I was still guilty of breaking the law, and I broke it because of my own negligence. In the other case, I also broke the law, and I paid the price, but I broke it unintentionally. I simply didn't know what the speed limit was. I should have. That cop didn't know this, but I used to live right around the corner. I should have known what the speed limit was in that road. See, whether it was through ignorance or through negligence, the law was still broken. So turn with me to Leviticus chapter 4. Uh, we're working our way through this book, and one of the things that we're learning is that in order to follow the argument and, and use this book to help us to understand God, to help us to understand sin and grace and forgiveness, as well as his, his requirements for holiness and how to be conformed to the image of Christ, and in order for us to use this book as Christians, we actually need to take big bites of the book. We need to look at larger passages and see the themes and applications as opposed to going through this verse by verse like we did, um, for example, in the book of 1 Corinthians or Titus or the Gospel of John. And so this morning we're going to be looking at the, the sin offering of chapter 4, which bleeds into chapter 5. And yet we're not going to get all the way through this today because there are some, there's actually some heavy and difficult things here. So this week will act as sort of um, an introduction for next week, I guess we could say, where we're going to get into the actual application for us as Christians, although there is certainly some application in this for us today. And I think this will make more sense as we get into this. 
So let's read this chapter. This is longer than the chapters that have come before it and also has some other key differences as well as similarities. So be looking for those as we read this. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If if anyone sins unintentionally in any of the Lord's commandments about the things not to be done, and does any one of them, if it is the anointed priest who sins, thus bringing guilt on the people, then he shall offer for the sin that he has committed a a bull from the herd without blemish um, to the Lord for a sin offering. He shall bring the bull to the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord and Lay his hand on the head of the bull and kill the bull before the Lord. The anointed priest shall take some of the blood of the bull and bring it into the tent of meeting. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle part of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar and of fragrant incense before the Lord that is in the tent of meeting. And all the rest of the blood of the bull he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And all the fat of the bull of the sin offering he shall remove from it, the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them and the loins and the long lobe of the liver he shall remove with the kidneys, just as these are taken from the ox of the sacrifice of the peace offerings." And the priest shall burn them on the altar of burnt offering. But the skin of the bull and all its flesh with its head, its legs, its entrails, and its dung, and all the rest of the bull, he shall carry outside the camp to a clean place, to the ash heap, and he shall burn it up on the fire on a fire of wood. On the ash heap it shall be burned up. If the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally and the thing is hidden, from the eyes of the assembly, and they do any one of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done, and they realize their guilt. When the sin which they have committed becomes known, the assembly shall uh, offer a bull from the herd for a sin offering and bring it in front of the tent of meeting. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull before the Lord, and the bull shall be killed before the Lord. Then the anointed priest shall bring some of the blood of the bull into the tent of meeting. and The priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord in front of the veil. And he shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar that is in the tent of meeting uh, before the Lord. And the rest of the blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of the burnt offering that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And all its fat he shall take from it and burn it on the altar. Thus he shall do with the bull... As he did with the bull of the sin offering, so he shall do with this. And the priest shall make atonement for them, and they shall be forgiven. And he shall carry the bull outside the camp and burn it up as he burned the first bull. It is the sin offering for the assembly. When a leader sins, doing unintentionally any one of the things that by the commandments of the Lord his God ought not to be done, and realizes his guilt or the sin which he has committed is made known to him, he shall bring as his offering a goat, a male without blemish, and shall lay his hand on the head of the goat and kill it in the place where they kill the burnt offering before the Lord. It is a sin offering. Then the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and uh, put it on the horns of the altar of the burnt offering and pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar of the burnt offering. And all its fat he shall burn on the altar, like the fat of the sacrifice of peace offerings. So the priest shall make an atonement for him for his sin, and he shall be forgiven. If any one of the common people sins unintentionally in doing any one of the things that uh, by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done, and he realizes his guilt or the sin which he has committed is made known to him, he shall bring for his offering a goat, a female without blemish, for his sin which he has committed. And he shall lay on his hand, his hand on the head of the sin offering and kill the sin offering in the place of burnt offering. And the priest shall take some of its blood with its finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour out all the rest of its blood at the base of the altar. And all its fat he shall remove as the fat is removed from the peace offerings. And the priest shall burn it on the altar for a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And the priest shall make atonement for him and he shall be forgiven." If he brings a lamb as his offering for a sin offering, he shall bring a female without blemish and lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and kill it for a sin offering in the place where they kill the burnt offering. 
Then the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour out the rest of its blood at the base of the altar. And all its fat he shall remove as the fat of the lamb is removed from the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall uh, burn it on the altar on top of the Lord's food offerings. And the priest shall make an atonement for him for the sin which he has committed and he shall be forgiven. Now, let's stop and pray. Father, we pray that you would give us what we need today. We are a needy people. I pray that you would meet our needs through your word. Feed us today, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, consider the timeline of the Pentateuch, the the first five books of the Old Testament. Uh, The book of Leviticus was given, the the laws and the, the, the events surrounding the giving of the law here that we're reading about. This takes place while the nation of Israel was at Mount Sinai. But the events of the book of Genesis take place over a long period of time, over 400 years earlier. So everything in the book of Genesis takes place at least 400 years before the people of Israel received the law of God at Mount Sinai. Actually, probably closer to 500 years. And yet the first three offerings, chapters 1, 2, and 3, the first three offerings that we have read about, the burnt offering, the grain offering, and the peace offering, are all found during the time of Genesis before the law was given. So for example, all the way back in Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 to 22, we read this. Genesis 8 says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Noah offered burnt offerings that pleased the Lord. We know that even after the flood, however, sin continued. Hundreds of years later, the apostle Paul will explain the purpose of the law. And so in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, he says this, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Paul is saying there that, that the law acts as, as kind of a spotlight. It reveals the sins that we commit, either that we didn't know were sin, or the sins that we commit in secret even just in our own hearts and minds, the sins that other people might never even see. And so when we come to chapter 4, we can see that there is a transition here, even right at the beginning. Just, Just look at the first verse. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, the last time we saw that, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, was in the very first verse of the book. Leviticus chapter 1. So there's a thematic break. There's a difference between the first three offerings and this, this, this sin offering. And to help us to understand the difference, let me ask you this question. Is worship voluntary or compulsory? Is worship voluntary or is it compulsory? While you're thinking about that, I could ask it this by way of analogy. Is obedience to parents voluntary or compulsory? I've made that kind of analogy many times. It's compulsory, right? And yet we want our children to obey voluntarily, don't we? Children, obey your parents. You must obey your parents, and yet we want them to obey out of love and respect, right? The same is true for worship. 
which by definition means that the same is true for the, uh, the elements of worship. The same is true for church attendance, for singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The same is true for giving an offering for every element of worship. And so in that sense, the first three offerings are voluntary. Be sure you don't understand that to mean optional. It doesn't mean optional. They are not optional they are required, but they are to be given happily and joyfully and, and voluntarily. But these next two offerings are compulsory. The sin offerings and the guilt offerings. They have to give these. Now, the main sin offering required by God was offered once a year on the Day of Atonement. But even then, and, and that's... Um, the instructions regarding the Day of Atonement are in Leviticus 16 and 17. But even, even then, even when the, the sin offering of the Day of Atonement is offered, in fact, just let me read, it's Leviticus 16, 3. But in this way, Aaron, the high priest, shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And then verse 5 says this, And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And so we could see these offerings not only as um, voluntary versus compulsory in those ways that I described, but also as um, I am a sinner, generally speaking, the burnt offering is brought. I am a sinner, generally speaking, so I bring this burnt offering and I need forgiveness and I need purification for these specific sins. And so I bring this sin offering. And God, by his grace has made a provision for, for cleansing his people from their sin that they may safely enter into his presence. And this, this is absolutely essential. Sinful acts and defiling conditions of any kind must be dealt with if communion with God is going to be maintained. Sin and, and defilement must be dealt with if we are to, to, to maintain a, a sweet communion with God. What the law reveals is that sins of any kind, sins of any kind are detestable to God and therefore must be dealt with. Sin angers God, defiles his sanctuary. It puts a barrier between God and his people. But it's not, just that, it's not just that sin defiles. The effects of sin are just as dangerous. We live in a sin-filled world. And as such, we have to deal with the effects of sin all around us. We have to deal with the stench. We have to deal with the contamination, the corruption. We have to deal with the diseases. We have to deal with the death. And under the Levitical system in Israel, under this law here specifically, these things, we see this, these things rendered a person unclean and they would bring defilement to God's holy places. Now, remember this as, as we consider all of this. One of the promises of God as he says, I will dwell with my people. And in the Old Testament, he did that in the tabernacle. And then later in the temple after Solomon builds the first temple. Of course, in the New Testament, John tells us in John chapter 1 verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us, and we have seen his glory, glories of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then, of course, Paul will ask in 1 Corinthians 3.16, he says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? I will dwell with my people, he has said. This concept of a, of a holy place it might be foreign to us because we know that the Holy Spirit dwells in us as 
Christians, and we are therefore made holy because of the work of Christ. But for the ancient Israelites, they could see they could see the cloud during the day and a pillar, or dur- yeah, during the day and a pillar of fire at night that indicated God's presence with them, God's presence in the tabernacle in a specific place, even in the most holy place, the the holy of holies. And if they were to come close to God, if they were to approach Him in worship, He says they must first be made clean. They must be made clean. So here's the thing. Our holy God will not wink at sin. He's not going to brush it off. A God who is described in the book of Revelation as holy, 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 will not say, don't worry about it. Don't, Don't worry about that. Habakkuk said that God is of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. And that's still true. And so for the Israelites, the Lord's house, the place where they would meet with him, must be purified. He must deal with their impurities. And so the sin offering that we're reading about here is more specialized sacrifice than the, than the burnt offering. And it was therefore, it was offered less frequently than the burnt offering. Burnt offering was offered all the time. The burnt offering said, we're sinners. The sin offering said, here's how we sinned, and we need to be made clean. In order order to understand this um, particular offering, we need to understand that that while this is throughout this chapter and throughout the, the book, It's called a sin offering. The sacrifice also deals with the consequences of sin and the the defilements of life that don't necessarily require forgiveness. In fact, I think it might be helpful, um, even though the Bible specifically uses the term sin offering here, it might be helpful for us to also think of this offering as a purification offering. Here's what I mean when I say it. They don't necessarily require forgiveness. This really trips people up sometimes. Chapter 12 of Leviticus, um, I'm just going to read verses 6 and 7, although the whole chapter is about the same thing, childbirth. But verses 6 and 7 of Leviticus chapter 12 says this. And when the days of her her purifying are completed, whether for a son or for a daughter... She, that is the new mom, shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a lamb, a year old, for a burnt offering, and a pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. And he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. Then she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who bears a child, either male or female. Why does the Lord, why does God require a sin offering for a new mom. It's because of Genesis chapter 3, specifically verse 16, which says to, to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. That's part of the curse. Now we're going to get into this more when we get into chapter 12, but there's There's nothing inherently sin... We need to be sure that you hear this. There's nothing inherently sinful about childbirth. That's not what this is saying. In fact, we rejoice in hearing the kids. We rejoice that there are kids, that there are pregnant... We pray for them every single week, right? There's nothing inherently sinful, but what's going on here? What's going on is that the effects of sin, the effects of sin being in the world, the direct effect of the curse is there at childbirth. And therefore, purification was needed. So I do think it is helpful for us to think of this offering as a purification offering. And again, we'll get into that more in chapter 12. This offering is brought really for two different conditions. Conditions. 
Uh, We're going to see, actually, chapters 12 to 15, that this would be brought because of significant, uh, what we could call significant physical impurities, like childbirth, as I said, but then also because of various illnesses or diseases, which also are not necessarily, in fact, frequently not the fault of the person who is sick, right? We all understand that there is disease in the world because sin is in the world. And a person maybe even has cancer, not because they did something wrong necessarily, but because there's sin in the world, right? And it affects all of us is the point. The fault of sin being in the world, and so we must be made pure. It's it's evidence that sin is in the world, and we must be made pure before our holy God. But the second condition in which this offering would be brought is for the condition of, uh, the commission of, as this chapter says, unintentional sin. This chapter deals with particular instructions regarding the offering itself, and and specifically dealing with, with sin, But we need to talk about what this sin is because the translation of the phrase unintentional sin actually isn't that perfect, especially to how we hear that. See, unintentional there doesn't, it might, but it doesn't necessarily mean I didn't know it was wrong, like speeding when you didn't see the reduced speed limit ahead sign or sign was missing or whatever excuses. Ask Steve, he can give you a whole list of excuses that people have given him over the years, I'm sure. Just because you didn't know the law doesn't mean you can get away with breaking the law, right? We we understand this with, there's all kinds of laws on the books in our nation, in our society, in our our state, in our even local town that we don't even know our laws. But just because we don't know the law doesn't mean we can get away with breaking the law. Now, It does mean that, but that's not the extent of it. There's a passage in the book of Numbers um, that I think is helpful for us to understand this. It's Numbers 15, just verses 27 to 31. Numbers 15, 27 to 31 says this. If one person sins unintentionally, he shall offer a female goat a year old for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement before the Lord for the person who makes a mistake when he sins unintentionally to make an atonement for him and he shall be forgiven. You shall have one law for him who does anything unintentionally for him who is native among the people of Israel and for the stranger who sojourns among them. But the person who does anything with a high hand, whether he's a native or a sojourner, reviles the Lord And that person shall be cut off from among his people because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. That person shall be utterly cut off. His iniquity shall be on him. So those verses, Numbers 15, it contrasts the the unintentional sin with what he calls there a high-handed sin. And that high-handed sin is that sin which, which defiantly shakes its fist at God. A high-handed sinner is the one who reviles and blasphemes the Lord. This is the man who knows he's sinning and doesn't care. This is, to kind of bring this down a little bit, this is the kid that after you've told him several times, don't do that, don't eat that, don't touch that, they look you dead in the eye and reaches over and does it. That's what this is talking about. In fact, it says there that they are to be cut off from his people. That person is living in outright rebellion. And so for the adulterer in the church of Corinth, for example, Paul puts it like this. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present... With the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So these unintentional sins aren't necessarily just simply sins of oops. (laughs) This is about repentance. Repentance. 
This is about a, a heart of repentance, a heart that desires to be made clean. This is about the heart that acknowledges that we are sinful to the core, and yet the penitent man desires to be made pure before the Lord. The person with a repentant heart, when his sin is made known to him, repents, turns back to God, says, yes, I did that. Those who are, those who are truly God's people are concerned with their own purity. They are concerned with the purity of the church. They are concerned with the restoration and communion with God and with his people. But there's something else here as well. Did, did, you, um, did you notice the similarities and the differences between this offering and the, the burnt offerings, specifically the burnt offerings and the peace offerings of chapters 1 and 3. There's some similarities and some differences. So here, um, the sections, the, the paragraphs that we read, they're, they're not really divided by the type of animal the person brings. I don't know if you noticed that. Whereas they, they are, in the, especially in chapter 1, they're actually divided by who is bringing the offering. So, um, as I said earlier, this, this kind of runs over into chapter 5, and we'll get into that in the next week or so. For now, I want to point out kind of the outline here of chapter 4. This, th there's a lot in here, and it's repetitive, as many of these chapters are, so it's good to see an outline. Um, following an introduction in the first couple of verses here, uh, there's instructions for the anointed priest in, in verse 3. The high priest. Actually, it runs from verse 3 down to verse 12. Then he instructs the entire congregation of Israel, the nation, in, in verses 13 to 21. Then he says a leader who sins, verses 22 to 26. And then finally for common Israelites at the end, in verses 27 through the end of the chapter. And so the priest is instructed to sacrifice a bull as is the whole congregation of Israel when the nation sins in the second section. The leader in the third section is to bring a male goat without blemish, and then common people, normal Israelites, are required to offer either a female goat or a lamb. And then we'll see when we get into chapter 5 that those um, common Israelites who couldn't afford a goat or a lamb are allowed to bring birds um, a couple different kinds of birds. Again, this showing the Lord's kindness it shows that his grace is available to all who would repent. So if this whole chapter or really all of this instruction regarding this particular offering, if this is about sin and defilement, then we can't miss the fact that the sins of the priest, specifically the anointed priest, the high priest, the sins of the priests are weighted heavier than the sins of the other leaders leaders of tribes and clans, even. Verse 22. Likewise, see if you follow this, the sins of the entire congregation require a more costly sacrifice than those for the sins of individuals, common people. Verse 27. So consider a couple passages from the New Testament to pull this together for us. Apply this concept really to us. James chapter 3, verse 1 says this, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Among um, what I believe are some of the most terrifying, for me at least, verses in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 and 17, says this, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, Paul instructs Timothy, he says, Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, elders who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. Do you see the connection? See the connection between 
uh, sort of the, the rankings of the sin offerings in chapter 4 and the standard of especially those who teach God's word are held to in the New Testament. Now, the pastor of the church, I want to be really clear about this, the pastor of any church is not the high priest. Hebrews makes it abundantly clear that Jesus is our high priest and that through his sacrifice, his people have been made pure forever. But when the, let's just say, spiritual leader, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, when the spiritual leader of the people sins, the New Testament says that he is to be held to a higher standard as one who will give an account before the Lord. Do you know why? Do you know why that's true? Because of the danger of leading people astray. Now we could go off on an entire tangent here about the ways in which pastors and elders um, can lead their churches into sin. Sometimes it's through incorrect doctrine or, or unconfronted immorality or, or just by not protecting the flock from the wolves. But notice what the law says in verse 3 about the anointed priest. So Leviticus 4.3, if it is the anointed priest who sins, thus bringing guilt on the people. Now, part of the reason why this is such a strict law here is that the high priest was the only one of all of Israel who is allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. And then only once a year on the Day of Atonement. And so he serves as the, the covenant mediator between God and his people. Again, we're going to get into that in chapter 16, but when Christ died, the veil that's mentioned here in this chapter, the veil was torn. And so Christ is our high priest who always lives to intercede for us. He is our covenant mediator between the Father and his people. So on the one hand, we don't, we don't have to worry about this. Because the high priest, we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, and so we can hold fast to our confession. We don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive grace, uh, mercy, and find grace to help in our time of need. That means that, means that I can't lose your salvation. I could if, I, I would if I could. I would lose your salvation for you if I could, but I can't. It means that no pastor, no elder can bring guilt and condemnation on anyone for whom Christ has said, there is therefore now no condemnation. However, we all know that there are entire churches, entire denominations who might still claim the name of Christ, and yet long ago they abandoned the faith. Long ago they decided that Christ didn't actually rise from the dead. Not, not physically, certainly. That the word of God is not actually God's word. More of suggestions. It's a, it's, a, it's a living document in the sense that it changes over time. So what was outlawed then is... Now, okay. They say things like marriage is however you define it today, not how the Lord defines it. That holiness is no big deal. And, and that, that drift, that didn't happen overnight. It happened over many years. It happened because a, a little bit of leaven here and a, and a little bit of unintentional sin there worked its way into the seminaries. It worked its way into the pulpits, into the sermons, into the lives of the ministers. And it was unconfessed. It was unrepented. And eventually it brought guilt upon all in that church who put up with it, in that denomination or whatever. And those pastors, those teachers are held to a stricter standard than those whom they have led astray. But even for those churches, there is hope. Look at verses 13 and 14. Speaking of the entire 
congregation of Israel. Verse 13, and if, if the whole congregation of Israel sins unintentionally and the thing is hidden from the eyes of the assembly and they do any one of the things that by the Lord's commands ought not to be done and they realize their guilt and the sin which they have committed becomes known, the assembly shall offer a bull from the herd for a sin offering and bring it in front of the tent of meeting and they shall be forgiven. Jump down at the end there in verse 20. And the priest shall make atonement for them and they shall be forgiven. Forgiveness, purification, restoration is possible for all who will repent. Let me give you an example. Right now, <clears throat> there are entire congregations within the United Methodist Church denomination. There are entire congregations, entire local churches um, who are at this kind of crossroads. They're trying to decide if they'll leave a denomination that is headed further and further away from biblical authority. And, and if they leave that, where do they go? And even though we might have sharp theological and doctrinal disagreements with them, we need to be praying that the Lord would grant to them genuine repentance and that he would purify those churches just as he's done for this church. We need to be praying for them. Now contrast that, and some of you know people and love people in those churches, but contrast that with the Church of England, the Anglican Communion. They decided this week, quote, that gay couples would be allowed to come to church after a civil marriage or civil partnership to give thanks, to dedicate their relationship to God, and to receive God's blessing. That is a church, that, that is church-sanctioned blasphemy. That's what that is. I don't know if you've noticed this, um, it's become very apparent in the last few years, really since COVID kind of revealed a lot of the hearts of men. But really over the past decade, the American church has been seeing a real kind of sorting or sifting. I believe over time, this is going to lead to genuine purifying. Churches, local churches are having to make a stand on certain cultural issues and, and hot button topics like they'd never had to before. Because the real issue at play here is the truth and authority of God's word. That's what's going on. It's going on all over our society. And I pray that more churches would repent of their theological drift and come back to the truth and authority of God's word. And we need to be praying. We need to be praying for the church, our brothers and sisters in Christ. There are people in churches with wolves as pastors, as bishops, as whatever, who are believers that are following those who are leading them astray. We need to pray for repentance for these churches. So why am I spending so much time on this? In some sense, I'm preaching to the choir. It's because these things didn't happen overnight. The people of Israel here, they're given this law. They're given this law at Mount Sinai. Later, under various leadership of various kings and before that various judges, they will continue as a congregation, as a group of people, they will continue to turn their backs on God, to sin against him. You wonder why we read First and Second Kings over the last year or so. And at the end of every king's life, it lists whether he did evil in the eyes of the Lord or good in the eyes of the Lord. That king was held accountable for leading the entire nation astray. Or if he tore down the high places and the pagan idolatry that was around the land. The kings led people and the people went right along with them. I'm spending so much time on this because, um, because it could happen here. It wouldn't take much, honestly, 
This has happened in churches that we know and that we respect and that we love. It happens over time. It happens slowly. But it's that lack of purification, lack of repentance. But, and this is what is so important and the thing to pull out of this for today, the Lord graciously provides a way for them to be purified, for them to be restored. He provides for them repentance. It's at the end of every section in this law. The priest shall make atonement for them and they shall be forgiven. They shall be forgiven. The Lord graciously provides a way for forgiveness. And so let me finish this morning just by saying this. I actually have four points that I want to get to, but we'll get to them next week. As we look at this law, we should see this. If the people sin in this way, whether unintentionally or through ignorance, if they are led astray by sinful leaders or, or through their own lack of spiritual diligence, the Lord has provided for purification. He has provided through repentance. David was confronted. David was confronted with a, a heinous sin. And when confronted, when Nathan said to him, you are that man. David said, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean, wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. That is the that is the heart of repentance. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? The man with clean hands and a pure heart. Those who have been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. Pray with me. Father, as we consider these things, and some of this is so hard to get our mind around because we are... We're so inundated. Sin just sin and the effects of sin are all around us. Some are missing today because of colds, Lord. The reason that there are colds, the reason that there are chest colds and head colds and allergies and all of those things is because there is sin in the world. Because the world is so broken. And yet, Lord, we... We know that we can be made clean, that we can be purified, that we can be forgiven for our sins and the effects of our sin that is all around us through the blood of the lamb that was slain. We know that we can be forgiven through Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we, we come to your table today, Lord, not trusting in our own righteousness, but in your mercy. We're not worthy to gather up crumbs from your table. And yet you are merciful and gracious. And so, Father, as we come to your table today to commemorate, to remember, to proclaim the death of Jesus Christ, to celebrate, may we feed on him by faith that we may be united to him and he to us who is so worthy of with you and with the Holy Spirit, the, our God is worthy of eternal thanks and praise. And so we come to you this morning, Lord, rejoicing that you have made us clean in Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.